Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a while. Welcome to a brand new series that I spontaneously decided to make after being bitten by a tick the other day. Top tier foreshadowing, I know. I'm going to call this series The Critter Chronicles, and it's going to be a one-stop shop to explore the wide world of animals. I've always had a love of biology and the natural world, so I feel right at home making a series like this. With introductions out of the way, I will be starting the series off with the spotlight of the nasty little parasite that latched onto my elbow. The American dog tick, scientific name Dermacentaur variabilis, is a species of tick native to the eastern half of the United States, with some sightings in California as well. One of the best known hard ticks, this critter is a parasite that latches primarily onto mammals and feeds on blood. These highly common ticks are usually found in areas with little to no tree cover, like in open fields or along hiking trails. If you live east of the Rocky Mountains and you find yourself with a tick, the odds are it's an American dog tick. Colloquially, these critters are often called wood ticks. However, they should not be confused with their close cousins, Dermacentaur andersoni, better known as Rocky Mountain wood ticks. Though they are only cousin species, both D. variabilis and D. andersoni are both known vectors of several diseases that can infect humans, including Rocky Mountain spotted fever and tularemia. Note that I will be using the terms American dog tick and D. variabilis interchangeably throughout the rest of this video. Corporate needs you to find the differences between this picture and this picture. Intel has told us there are at least seven. Okay, I already see one. Give him. Also, I will discuss more of the epidemiology related to wood ticks shortly. But first, I'd like to dive into a bit of physiology. For those who don't know, Ticks are not insects. The truth is, they are classified as arachnids. Don't believe me? Take some time to count the number of legs you see on this tick here. Pause the video if you need to. Okay, spoiler alert, the answer is 8, not 6. And that is why I decided to name this section Arachnology, the study of arachnids. Definitely a nightmare job for some people. Also, this is the third ology in this video so far, and we have a lot more where that came from. Anyway. While the taxonomy of the American dog tick is as complicated as any other living being, only a couple of classifications really matter to the average person. Officially, D. variabilis is in the kingdom of Animalia, the phylum of Arthropoda, the class of Arachnida, and the order of Ixodida. In friendlier terms, the American dog tick is an animal, an arthropod, an arachnid, and a tick. Yeah, seems pretty obvious when you state it that way, doesn't it? And yes, ticks are related to both spiders and crabs, sharing the family of arthropods. I could spend a ton of time on taxonomy alone, but for the sake of getting the most out of this video, I will be moving on. D. variabilis has a life cycle similar to most other tick species, aside from one single difference. Unlike the majority of other ticks, these stubborn bloodsuckers prefer to feed on the same host throughout all life stages. That's right. An American dog tick, if it can, will suck the blood of the same animal throughout its entire life. Talk about a freeloader. However, as you can imagine, this is not always possible. I will discuss the more common scenario that a tick might achieve, known as the three-host life cycle. Phase 1. The cycle begins when a female tick lays her eggs on the ground. A single female American dog tick can lay up to 6,000 eggs in a clutch before she dies. Phase 2. The larvae will hatch with six legs, primarily feed on small mammals, and drop to the ground to molt. Phase 3. After molting, the ticks will be eight-legged nymphs. These nymphs will again feed on small mammals and drop to the ground for one final molt. Phase 4. Fresh adults will feed and mate on larger mammals, including livestock and pets. I'm pretty sure you won't see this happening on humans, as we tend to remove ticks quickly. But anyway, after mating, the ticks will drop off. The males will die swiftly, while the females lay their eggs before dying. What a life. This whole process can take one to two plus years, depending on how effectively a tick can find hosts. As such, the typical lifespan of D. variabilis can be anywhere from two months to two years. It takes a single blood meal to transition between each of the life cycle stages. One from larva to nymph, one from nymph to adult, and one for a female to develop her eggs. 
If worst comes to worst, these absolute champs can go two whole years as an adult without feeding, so there may be some ticks living well past average lifespan in a given area. Now that we are all tick life cycle experts, let's talk about anatomy. Unlike spiders, ticks lack two distinct body segments. They simply have one body, eight legs, and a head. Most ticks, including D. variabilis, have small, flat bodies. Furthermore, hard ticks are known for their squish-resistant back plates. A thin, strong body makes it easy for them to latch onto a host, fully feed, and dip out without being noticed. Make no mistake, however, the American dog tick is a notoriously slow feeder, so you will most likely catch an adult before it gets its fill. As for the larvae, they can be smaller than a freckle, so most get away with a clean feed. The adults can be quite large pre-feeding. The female tick I plucked off my elbow was about the size of a miniature chocolate chip. And no, I didn't eat it. Officially, adults have been reported to measure anywhere from 5 millimeters to 15 millimeters, depending on whether or not they are engorged. I don't know what that is in inches, you can go figure it out. Similar to us humans, American dog ticks display sexual dimorphism. This means the adult males and females look different from one another. For the ticks, this is just a matter of patterns on their bodies. Both adults are primarily a reddish-brown hue, more brown than red, but there's a little bit of a red tint in there. Adult females have a characteristic off-white scutum right behind the head, while males have a mottled off-white pattern covering their entire body. The nymphs and larvae are seemingly indistinguishable by gender, with a light brown coloring and off-white patterning. In my opinion, the most interesting part of the tick is its mouth parts. These seem to be nearly the same across most species. There are two palps, little graspers that do not pierce the host's skin, two chelicerae, knife-like appendages that cut the skin, and one hypostome, a barbed needle-like appendage used for extracting blood. Time for an aha moment. The reason ticks can be such a pain to remove is due to this barb. It is almost like a fish hook in design. On top of this, many species of ticks secrete a cement-like saliva from their hypostome that will only dissolve once feeding is finished. With that, I think I have given a good enough idea of the basic biology behind D. variopolis, and many other ticks at that. So, it is now time to discuss the geographical distribution of this species. American dog ticks prefer grassy areas with little to no vegetation. This allows them to encounter larger animals frequently, and unfortunately, have run-ins with humans as well. Commonly, a tick will latch onto a dog, be brought into a home, and later find its way onto a human, hence the name dog tick. American dog ticks are widely distributed east of the Rocky Mountains, but as I said before, you can find them in select areas of the west coast. Adult ticks spend the winter in the soil and are mostly active from mid-April to early September. On the other hand, larvae are most commonly found from March to July. And finally, nymphs are usually encountered from June to early September. Interestingly, when you start traveling north past Massachusetts, timing spans from April to August, peaking in May and June. This shorter frame of time is no doubt due to the cold northern temperatures come autumn. There is more variation from state to state, but on average, all stages of D. variabilis are found somewhere throughout five to seven months of the year, starting in April. I will now discuss how you can best deal with an attached tick. So, if you inhabit or have visited the U.S. Northeast like myself, you may have had a run-in with the American dog tick maybe even more than once. No matter the type of tick, there is little in this world quite as uncomfortable as finding out you have one buried in your skin, especially since they like to dig into soft, warm spaces like behind your ear or under your arm. Even finding one on your pet can be unnerving. How do you deal with a situation like this should it arise? Well, in the shortest explanation possible, you want to safely remove the tick and dispose of it promptly. With a bit more explanation, any attached tick should be grasped with a firm yet precise tool, like tweezers, and carefully pulled until it releases. This may take some time, as the tick can be deep in the skin or begin squirming when disturbed. That was an issue for me when I was trying to get it off my elbow, the darn thing kept, like, moving around. Ugh. 
It is vital to achieve removal without separating the head from the body or crushing the creature. Allowing this to happen will increase the chances of catching a nasty pathogen. So to reiterate all of this, grab the tick with a pair of tweezers, gently grasp it, and apply controlled upward force until it releases. I know this can be a bit difficult, especially if the tick is attached to a very furry pet, but you should always be patient when removing these little bloodsuckers. It doesn't hurt much at all, I promise. Something else I feel like I should preface. Ignore all the popular claims of using Vaseline, alcohol, or whatever else to suffocate a tick while it is still attached. Simply put, do not mess with an attached tick. When feeding, these guys won't react much and won't easily let go of a host. Fiddling around is unsanitary and inefficient. Just stay calm and pluck the little parasites right off. After removing a tick, or perhaps finding one unattached, you may notice how difficult they are to crush. In reality, this is only true for species classified as hard ticks, which includes the American dog tick, of course. As I previously mentioned, these critters have a well-developed backplate known as the sputum, which makes them highly resistant to blunt trauma. The two most effective methods of eliminating a freed hard tick, in my opinion, are to burn it or drown it in alcohol. To avoid pathogen exposure, never crush a tick with your fingers. Honestly, I recommend dropping the tick into a small cup of rubbing alcohol. I would avoid the fire, especially kids. Seriously. As for you animal lovers out there, remember that ticks are parasitic, disease-spreading pests that lay thousands of eggs, so don't feel bad about disposing of one. I mean, I guess you could always throw it back outside, but the chances of it surviving are low. Like mosquitoes, ticks are infamous for their ability to spread various diseases to humans and animals alike. This is of course not done on purpose, it is simply a byproduct of how these parasites feed and change hosts. As stated at the beginning of this video, D. variabilis is most known to spread Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever and Tularemia. Both of these pathogens are bacterial infections, and though easily treated with antibiotics, they should be taken very seriously. According to the CDC, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, known as RMSF, is one of the deadliest tick-borne illnesses in the Americas. Most people who get infected with this bacteria develop a fever, headache, and characteristic rash. RMSF can indeed be deadly, with a mortality rate of around 20% if not treated with the correct antibiotic. Unfortunately, like many other bacterial and viral illnesses, the early symptoms of RMSF are not very unique. It could easily be mistaken for something else. However, the disease can rapidly progress into something far more serious. This is why it is absolutely critical that anyone who becomes ill after a wood tick bite, D. variabilis or D. andersoni, see their doctor swiftly. The late stage rash is very easy to identify, appearing two to four days after onset of a fever. The rash typically appears as red dots, splotches, or pinpoints on a person's extremities. However, it is best to catch this illness before the rash even begins for maximum safety. Again, if you have ever been bitten by a tick, any kind, forget just wood ticks, and develop symptoms including fever, headache, rash, nausea, vomiting, stomach pain, muscle pain, and or lack of appetite, it is best to contact your doctor as soon as possible. A medical professional will be able to diagnose and treat you effectively, regardless of the illness in question. Some good news here is, since the American dog tick is such a slow feeder, RMSF spread is rare. In fact, it is said that a tick must be attached for a good 6-8 to eight hours before the pathogen even has a chance to transfer. Even so, it is important to remain vigilant if bitten. Some more good news is a clean recovery from RMSF will leave no chronic health issues or reoccurring infections. But treating the initial infection late can lead to problems such as damaged blood vessels, amputations, hearing loss, mental disability, and paralysis. But again, you're only at risk of those if you wait long to get diagnosed. Moral is, take this illness seriously, people. According to the CDC, tularemia is a disease that can actually infect both people and animals. Rabbits, hares, and rodents are most at risk, and often die in large numbers due to this bacterial infection. While the infection can come from multiple sources, I will keep the focus on the bite of the American dog tick. Tularemia can actually be expressed in different forms once a person is infected. 
The main forms acquired through tick bite are ulceroglandular, glandular, pneumonic, and typhoidal. Ulceroglandular tularemia is the most common form and usually occurs following a tick or deer fly bite after handling an infected animal. A skin ulcer appears at the site of bacterial entry and is accompanied by swelling of regional lymph glands. Affected glands are usually in the armpits or groin. Glandular tularemia is similar, but lacks the characteristic ulceration of the bite site. Pneumonic tularemia is the most serious form of the disease. Symptoms include coughing, chest pain, and difficulty breathing. This form can occur after breathing in the pathogen or when ulceroglandular or glandular tularemia is left untreated. This is an infection of the lungs, which, as many of you may know after the recent pandemic, can be very serious. Finally, typhoidal tularemia is any combination of the general symptoms without the localizing symptoms of other syndromes. The moral here is similar to before. Take this illness seriously, people. Stay away from fly slash tick infected carcasses and avoid handling wild animals if you can. If you believe you may have contracted any form of tularemia, contact your doctor. Interestingly, while American dog ticks are often exposed to the bacterial species that causes Lyme disease, they are not a vector for transmission. In other words, if you are bitten by D. variabilis, you are not, I repeat, not at risk of contracting Lyme disease. So yeah, you might get one of the nastiest tick-borne illnesses in the USA, but hey, no Lyme disease. That handles a bit of the epidemiology behind D. variabilis. I know with the current state of the world there is a lot of anxiety surrounding illness, but I want my viewers to remember, pathogens like RMSF and tularemia can be easily avoided by quickly removing ticks or staying tick free. And if you are unlucky enough to get sick, seeing a doctor quickly will have you safe and sound. Don't lose sleep over this guys, just be responsible. What better way to cap this creepy crawly journey off than with some tips on avoiding ticks? If you are mindful, you may never have a run-in with the American dog tick. Of course, a person can only do so much, but there are things that will drastically reduce your chance of becoming the host of D. variabilis or any tick for that matter. Tip 1. Use chemical repellent with DEET, permethrin, or picaridin. Always be mindful of possible allergies and avoid breathing these chemicals in. Tip 2. Wear light-colored, long, protective clothing. Boots with long socks are a great choice for hiking. Tuck your pant legs into socks for added protection. Tip 3. Avoid tick-infested areas. General research will provide you with the times and places where ticks will be an issue. And finally, tip 4. Check yourself, others, and pets for ticks daily, especially after spending some time outside. Remember, Ticks can often end up in tricky spots like inside earlobes, under arms, or in a thick head of hair. Remove ticks quickly and carefully as I previously instructed. If you follow these tips, the chances of you having a bad run-in with a tick will be drastically lowered. And that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes our dive into the world of the American dog tick. Allow me to impart a bit of philosophy onto you before this video concludes. Ticks may be parasites, and they certainly can be both dangerous and annoying. But remember, just like us, they are living beings. Believe it or not, they serve a purpose in the environments they inhabit. So though ticks may be pests, you can learn to coexist with them via avoidance. At the end of the day, they just do what they need to do to survive. If you are careful, you can effectively stay out of their crosshairs, which will be beneficial for both them and you. I hope you all enjoyed this video. It's a new format for this channel, and I might do more Critter Chronicles in the future. If you did enjoy it, consider leaving a like on it and subscribing to the channel. I have a plethora of other narration content, including horror and comedy on my channel. So check it out. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned, and stay the heck away from ticks.